We've all been faced with difficult people at work, some of us perhaps more than others. Jason has a coworker who seems to argue over everything. Merrill's boss is a micromanager. Liz has an employee who is passive aggressive, saying yes to your face, but then undermining you behind your back. What types of difficult people have you worked with? Have you successfully avoided confrontations with these people? Or have you successfully initiated open dialogue with them? The first step to dealing with difficult people, and perhaps the hardest step, is to avoid blaming personality. The person may indeed have a diagnosable personality disorder, but jumping to this conclusion disempowers you as a leader. If it is really their personality, it means that it is a stable trait that will resist your attempts to manage it. So instead of dealing with difficult people, let's reframe the problem as dealing with people's difficult behavior. With a focus on the behavior, you can approach the situation like an investigator, trying to identify the external cause of the unwanted behavior. Doing this frames that behavior as a problem that can be solved. So, start by trying to reserve your judgment. Recognize that you probably don't have all the information you need to really understand why the difficult person is behaving this way. This can be challenging if you are actively involved. If you go in hot, it will be harder to approach the problem logically and objectively. Next, it is really important to understand why the person engages in the undesired behavior. One way to approach this is to do a root cause analysis. Ask yourself, why does this person act in this way? Stay away from personality. If your answer to the why question is, because they're difficult, you're not thinking like an investigator. Once you think you understand why, ask the question again and again until you've found the root of the issue. Oftentimes, if you are dealing with an ongoing difficult behavior, the root cause analysis will boil down to some underlying personal issue, fear, or insecurity in the person. For example, supervisors who are new or feel that their authority is illegitimate often overcompensate by being too authoritative and defensive against alternative ideas. Micromanagers' obnoxious controlling behavior often stems from a lack of trust in their employees or sometimes feelings of being out of control. Unengaged workers may feel undervalued or poorly treated by the organization and may distance themselves to protect their feelings of self-worth. Decision makers who never actually settle on a decision may be afraid of failure. In this case, if you can understand why someone has a frustrating or ineffective behavioral quirk, it makes it much easier to manage it. You may be able to appease their insecurity head on. At the very least, it will help you empathize with their perspective. Sometimes people are simply unaware of the effect of their behavior on others. Maybe the difficult person was unaware that her natural ability to play the devil's advocate was throwing off the team dynamic. If employees do not have a high level of emotional intelligence, they may not even know that their coworkers are frustrated. A respectful but frank conversation can sometimes go a long way to resolving the issue. Your root cause investigation might also reveal a mismatch of information. The disagreement may be due to different assumptions or information sets. Maybe the person has unique information that the team was not aware of, resulting in her stubbornness to fall in line with the team's objective. If this is the case, identifying the information discrepancy may actually be quite useful for the organization, and a double check might quickly resolve the issue. Other times, the root cause analysis might reveal an underlying value conflict. Coworkers might disagree because they have different value systems that prioritize different aspects of the work. Let me illustrate this one with an example. When speaking to an organization of about 150 employees, I started by listing their publicly stated organizational values up on the board. Fortunately, they recognized them. Referring to the first value, let's say it was service. I asked them, who thinks this is an extremely important value in this organization? Everybody raised their hands. Referring to the second value, let's say it was people. Who thinks people is an extremely important value for this organization? Most people raise their hands. And so on through each of the seven values, safety, respect, profit, etc. Then I asked them, who thinks service is the most important value up here? The staff looked around the room and slowly a few people raised their hands. I then said, who thinks people is the most important value? 
the hands of the HR staff quickly went up. Okay, who thinks profit is the most important? Everyone turned to look at the CEO. This pattern of conflicting value priorities is very common. Most employees are willing to endorse a set of positive organizational values. However, when asked to prioritize them, tensions arise. Most organizational decisions require a value trade-off of some sort. Profit is sacrificed for safety. Service is cut back to enhance profits. If people differ in their value priorities, they are likely to disagree when a decision forces the organization to sacrifice one for the other. Deep down, the conflict stems from a difference in core values. This diversity of values can help to balance the organization's priority system, and the variety of different perspectives helps leaders to make informed decisions. However, it can also give rise to conflict. So, you can use a root cause analysis as a tool to understand the source of undesirable behaviors. However, while this may help to formulate a reasonable guess at the root cause of a difficult behavior, recognize that you are making some assumptions. To accurately identify the source of the behavior, you will likely need to have a difficult conversation. In many cases, people prefer to avoid risking a confrontation, and this is where the process stalls. If you are open to a bit of self-reflection, you can take this one step further. What type of difficult person really gets under your skin? What is your hot button issue? Maybe you find that particular behavior difficult because of your own value priorities and your own fears and insecurities. It takes two to have a conflict. Perhaps you are someone else's difficult person. Effective leaders are self-reflective and self-aware. It takes courage to confront your own weaknesses and insecurities, but doing so can improve your leadership practice. In terms of practical advice for moving from speculation to actually having difficult conversations about difficult behavior, Edmondson and Smith outline three key practices. First, manage yourself. Don't get hijacked by the emotions in the moment. Give yourself time to reflect. Is your interpretation of the situation accurate? Is your reaction appropriate? Divorce yourself from the situation and approach the situation coolly and objectively. Take advantage of the opportunity to reframe the situation. Look at it from the other person's perspective. Approach it as a problem to be solved. Second, manage the conversation. Verify your information. Check your assumptions. Frame the conversation as investigating the root cause and collectively resolving the issue. If the source of the issue is a value conflict, consult others to get clarification on the organizational priorities, or work together to creatively identify a third option. Finding this third option will first require recognizing the underlying values driving the disagreement. If the source of the issue is more interpersonal in nature, try discussing the issue as being about your reactions to certain behaviors, rather than the other person's behavior. Frame it as a puzzle. Show respect for different perspectives. Focus on understanding the dynamics of the interaction. If you set a constructive tone for the conversation, they may reveal their insecurities that trigger the behavior. Third, manage relationships. If you manage the conversation well, you may come out of it with mutual respect and an even stronger relationship. You can improve the likelihood of this outcome by building grounded trust, discussing strengths and weaknesses, without critique, can build trust and empathy for the future. The relationship may also benefit from mapping out the evolution of the negative interaction. How are the person's actions interpreted and experienced by another person? What is the reaction? And then, how is that reaction experienced and interpreted by the first person? And so on, in a cyclical pattern of communication. Having difficult conversations is one of those things that may come naturally to you, or you may need to work at it. While it may make perfect sense and seem easy in concept, actually doing it takes some amount of courage and self-confidence. If you recognize that this is a weakness in your leadership capabilities, try using a trusted friend to practice with, role-playing the conversation, or record yourself opening the conversation and then playing it back while imagining how the other person might respond. And if these suggestions feel uncomfortable to you, there's a good chance that having difficult conversations is one of your leadership capabilities that could use a bit of improvement. 